been a, a, a key uh, colleague of uh, the Fan World Business and Events is Jeremy Savage. I'm just going to come up and just chat through. So what we we thought actually we would throw a spotlight on Canterbury, um, and as Jeremy sets up, uh, one of the things we no we've noticed in this Canterbury market is that um, the land there, in a relative sense, seems very affordable when you start reflecting some of the comments that Andy made around Canterbury, particularly in terms of soils, water, and the level of science that sits alongside many of the farming practices in Canterbury. And we thought we'd throw a spotlight on Canterbury for that reason, so we're going to drop into a bit of detail on that. But we obviously, we, there's a myriad of other opportunities um, outside of that region, and we can chat about that outside of the session. But the, um, the interesting thing, if you take the dairy sector, in 13 and 14, in the dairy sector and land transactions in Mid Canterbury, there was $466 million of dairy farm sales, um, and every second dollar of that was to hedge funds. Um, this is about 13 and 14 season. Now, if you compare that to today, um, the season just ended, there were three dairy farms sold for $21 million. Now, the land hasn't changed, and if anything, the science and the, and the level of knowledge and the farm and business would be a good example as any. I mean, understanding how to optimise those farm systems and, and, and drive profits. Um, for our view, from a property broker's perspective, uh, we're leaning on the farm and business to sort of throw a bit of a spotlight. And obviously, Jeremy's um, led that personally with a very strong client business in the Canterbury. He's given us his time and flying up to share some of his insights. So, um, all the credit to you, Jeremy. Thanks. I will use this my voice a little bit like Andy's. Um, so I've been in uh, Mid Canterbury, uh, operating in Canterbury for 25 years as a consultant, and it's been a fun time. So I've gone through the, the wave of Canterbury conversions and land use change. Um, I work across the South Island uh, in the South, and then uh, own a dairy farm up in Golden Bay, where I was earlier today. Uh, first slide. Um, so what I'm going to just share with you is a bit of de detail around how our client base performs, and, and give you some uh, some numbers around returns as well. So. We have a mixed, uh, the numbers I've given you is we'll focus here on, on our Canterbury farms and, uh, and, and the, the property brokers pamphlets, a number of uh, the farms and the pamphlets are actually neighbours to my clients. We have a, uh, a mixed bag of management structures here. We don't have a lot of owner operators on farms um, amongst our client base. Most of the time we have uh, uh, contract milkers or share milkers. These are people who uh, have skin in the game, they're employed, they're contracted to milk the cows, they provide the staff, they provide the machinery and incentivised by how much milk they make. So it's a great model to uh, get them out of bed and get their staff out of bed and get the job done and do it well. Um, these farms are all irrigated uh, farms in mid Canterbury and I guess they're what we call A class land. So they are the, it is it is a good good country and we have um, so the uh, irrigation schemes are across Mid Canterbury, South Canterbury, and um, and also includes sort of central plain flinders, etc. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, just to uh, this is just some of the detail around it, and and uh, some of the benchmarks that we use in the dairy industry. So our client the Average farm that we work with is a big farm. It's 349 hectares uh, and 1,150 cows. Uh, the typical farms that are on the market at the moment are more like about 200 hectares and 600 cows. We don't get economies of scale. Once we get into these big farms, we actually start getting to diseconomies of scale because they become harder and harder to manage. So 600 cows is just as profitable as these big farms. Um, the stocking rate is 3.45 cows to the hectare. Um, and our product company is 1,640 kilos of milk sold to hectare. We worked quite hard with our client base over the last 10 years to really drop out our footprint. It's our footprint around nitrogen leaching, greenhouse gas emissions. So most of our client base are actually producing less milk and have a lower stocking rate compared to their neighbours, uh, but they are just as profitable, if not more profitable as well. So we're finding that marginal bit of milk isn't any more profitable, it's creating a lot more pollution. So We've been pulling back with our client base. Uh, in terms of profitability um, and some of the key metrics here, which I'll, we'll get into a table in a minute, but our stock sales are usually about 45 cents a kilo. They, and this is last year's numbers. They actually got knocked around by COVID. We couldn't get animals off the farm. Our farm operating costs include everything from wages, 
to feed to fertiliser to um, insurance and rates. It doesn't include interest, and uh, that's four dollars twenty seven. The capital uh, that's actually plant replacement, so it's replacing plant and machinery, and um, and, and keeping up with compliance. Um, you just need to be careful with the aging stage of the farm that you're buying. They don't um, have something that's run out because they could be significantly higher than that. But the, the typical farm operating costs um, are for our farms are $4.52 per kilo of solids. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is looking at our uh, uh, EBITDA return on capital. Uh, so this is just after depreciation, after plant replacement. Um, and we've got a, we have a range of land values, so between $44,000 a hectare and $55,000 a hectare. So uh, land values since uh, over the last five or four years since the uh, Overseas Investment Office shut down the, uh, the, the money coming in from overseas super funds who are really interested in New Zealand dairy, um, especially Canada and South Zealand dairy, um, have dropped about 8 to 10%. So we're seeing, um, uh, we did see uh, land prices as high as 55,000 a hectare for some A-class smaller farm land. Um, and as of late, you know, sales have been sort of close, close to 46, 40, 48,000 for top farms, and some as low as 44 if they've been run down. Um, the, the return on capital at six dollar payouts um, we're looking at you know, a range of 6.8 to probably 6.3%. The reason that the $6, uh, the stress test that we, our, our banks will expect us to go through will be at $6 payouts. Uh, 5 8 6 dollars depending on your bank, and they are looking backwards. Uh, the 6 17 the reason why that one is there is that is the average payout of the last three years. And at the moment, the midpoint of the range is six dollars eighty. Uh, the average payout for the last ten years has been six dollars twenty, and that's included uh, includes a period where we overproduce milk in the world, um, and we've since got through that as well. So, um, and it does help to Andy's presentation in terms of um, we're sitting with uh, uh, in the last three four years. We've been sitting with a very nicely balanced supply and demand of milk in the world. So uh, demand for milk is about 1.8% per year. It's been compounding over the last 20 years as, as China and emerging markets uh, get into milk proteins. And uh, our supply of milk, 1.5% uh, a year. And, and to add these comments, you know, we're potentially peak cows at the, at the moment as well. They're pulling things back to meet our environmental constraints. So the and the reason why I just give that blurb is that the six dollars versus six seventy, you can see there's a significant difference in terms of return on capital going on there as well. So um, six dollars is a stress test to make sure you don't go broke. But my advice to clients at the moment, if you're looking strategically at purchasing assets or farm successions or when you grow your business, um, uh, you want to be looking at both numbers in there and, and don't don't miss out on an opportunity uh, because you were looking at six seventy and two facts on six. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the, uh, and uh, because we can borrow money, not quite as cheap as you can borrow money for a house, uh, our, our uh, interest rates for rural land, uh, if you're gearing, um, is not too bad, it's typically about three to three and a half percent. Um, but when you do a good return on capital, we're, uh, cheers, sorry, next one. Uh, sorry, our return on equity um, uh, because we're borrowing. So the, the typical debt we've got is about twenty dollars per kilo milk solids with a range of fifteen to to twenty two, twenty three. Uh, I've used a four percent interest rate there just to um, put a bit of a safety margin in it there. But we're about, we're in a to Conrad's point at the open presentation. We're in a really unique situation now with the dairy industry where we're getting some pretty positive cash returns out of farming which we're not used to. It was a capital gain story for many, many years, but now we're really looking at, at dairy farming being a, a good cash uh, investment. Can you would you say your clients are seeing more positive cash flow now than they have in many years? Yep, yeah, yep. So, um, yeah, there's a, a tip there, a dollar, a dollar per kilo of falling at the bottom of debt repayment and to um, 
uh, uh, the Conrad's slide, yeah, you saw the dead drop in the dairy industry as well, and that's been all repetitioned and put back into the banks, which by the sounds of it's all coming back here to all. So we're, we're getting some pretty solid returns there. Last question. Yeah, Oliver, oh, sorry. Sorry. It's, um, it's all great to sort of talk about all these sort of things in the end, but we've just been through a situation and you know, the future of who's running these things. You know, I look around this room, none of yep. us are going to run it. Yep. Um, <coughs> can't avoid anybody. Um, all these people have got all this money and got kids who want to go farming. Yep. I'm a farmer, generational thing. My kids aren't interested in farming. They might start looking at it if you get those returns up, but they still, you know, who wants to do the hours? Uh, still can't understand why, like horse racing and dairy farming, there are only two industries in the world that start at four o'clock for some unknown reason. Um, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, you know, who is going to do this work going forward? Where's, it, where's the staff coming from? Where's the labour issue coming from? Competent labour things. Yeah. So the, um, I think certainly from a cannery perspective, our industry's really matured over the last five years, ten years, um, around getting good people to run these businesses. Uh, we work with 60 farms. Um, I don't have a single owner operator in my client base. Um, I have about, out of the 60 farms, about five, eight sons involved in the business as contract, you know, share milkers, etc. cetera. Um, and the balance, and then the balance of it's actually run by contract milkers, variable orders. There's a few owners on the farms who keep a watchful eye on them. But that's probably only 30, 40% of my client base now. It's, um, so the, the industry's sort of moved out. A retention rate with keeping people on the farms, most of them will stay there for five to eight years plus now as well. It used to be three and, and quite tumultuous. The other thing that's kicked, the other thing as well, um, I would note is that, so if you go back to the old equity partnerships that were, um, were kicked into gear at, at around the year 2000 to 2010, four farmers tended to band together and buy a farm and then find someone who would farm um, and find a manager. My recommendation now for people investing in the industry is actually um, uh, uh, have a look around in terms of finding someone who will have a stake in the business as well and run the business for you. Uh, within my client base, I've got about four or five uh, people who have half a million of, it, of cash, probably can go borrow another half a million and can come into these businesses and run them and run them very, very well. Um, in fact, this farm here, I've got one person looking at it, uh, my client base, who's a share milker, and he's coming in looking at buying 25% of this farm. He'll make it work even better than this. Um, and another farm that's in the brochure as well, I have another person um, also has a spare half a million or half a million that have gone into it. In the past, uh, in the past, the way to farm ownership was to go buy cows, go 50-50 shear milking, and then go buy a cheap farm on the west coast um, to get into farm ownership. But what we're finding is people are enjoying Canterbury, they're keeping their kids there, and they're not willing to go to the west coast and buy their first farm. They would rather own 10 to 20% of a big farm and working with an investor as well. That's despite us having some really cheap, great money for money west coast farms to sell. Yeah. I think there's one other fact too in the industry. We've had to adjust our expectation of what sort of hours people would work on these farms. So I know on our place we run a three, a five day on, two day off roster. Um, so everybody either gets a Friday, Saturday off or a Sunday, Monday off, um, because they are seven days a week. But in my experience now on the dairy farms, the dairy farms are doing no more hours in the week than any other sort of farm, in some cases less. It does require more capital housing and Correct. obviously staff. Requires housing. more capital. And, 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 and there, are, there are higher wages because we are paying well and we're paying for you know, no more than a 50 hour week. So you're right, we've had, it, there is a cost to the industry to do it, but I think the old days of working the hell out of people's you know, seven days a week, well gone.